the administration. We're happy to to support that. But again, I'm looking at trying to, you know, I, I, I worry that if something doesn't happen positively by the 19th, then we're going to be talking about this uh, um, whole situation in, in more dire uh, terms where there's going to be more violence and more political repression. And I'm, I'm hoping that maybe that we all push harder that maybe we can avoid that. But uh, so I get, I'd like to may have all anybody who wants to, all of you want to comment on uh, what do we think of this process and what, what can we do specifically what can Congress do, what can the administration do to make this a success? I may start then. Yeah. Um, I think first of all is the acknowledgement that all parties are not created equal in this, in this process. We have a government, one side, we have a president mm -hmm. who holds the key to the impasse. I think we need to continue engaging the president directly not his surrogates, he has plenty of those, and that's a waste of time for everyone, uh, to engage the man who holds the key to the solution, is the president, and impress upon him the importance of the respect of the Constitution, to impress upon him the importance that he discharges the leadership that has been entrusted to him twice, mm -hmm. 2006 and 2011, and to respect the Constitution that he himself held in front of his people and said that he will be the guarantor of that. It's not the end of the world. He, he has um, a resume, has a track record, but I think he, he holds the country hostage. And uh, we need to acknowledge that and engage through the process through that. The Catholic Church is only as strong as the process or the mandate that it receives. If today people are not willing to go along with the Catholic Church, it's because they don't see an end game. If the principle does not say that he will uphold the Constitution and he is the way he's going to do it, then for a big chunk of the opposition, the opposition is fragmented, yes, but the key, the heavy hitters in the opposition are not going to join. Some of them in exile, some of the youth leaders in exile, some of them are in jail. There's just not enough goodwill for the key stakeholders to come along to this process. And I think institutions like yours <coughs> have to start at that point. Thank you. Sorry? Um, I, I would agree that the, the Catholic Church mediation does remain the best hope that we have now to finding a solution before December 19th, but we're only, it's only going to lead to a consensual agreement with a broad coalition of the opposition leaders and the majority if President Kabila makes some concessions. And unfortunately, we're seeing in recent weeks that he just appears to be increasingly defiant. It was very evident during the UN Security Council's visit to Kinshasa when Kabila said clearly that, yes, the Constitution has a term limit, but the Constitution can be amended. Mm -hmm. amended. So I think we do need to see more pressure on Kabila before the 19th to show him that the consequences are real uh, and that it would be in his best interest to stop the escalation of these consequences and do the right thing for him and for the country. Targeted sanctions is something that's it's ready to go, as I understand. It wouldn't take, it's something that, that can happen quickly before the 19th, so that's one clear step that can be taken. And as Mvemba said, working with regional leaders, trying to get to Kabila himself, showing him that this is the best option and the best way forward is, is critical. So working through the president of Angola, with South Africa, with others, and trying to get as many people to President Kabila himself uh, is, is critical here. But time is short, but that's, I think those two aspects are, are needed. Yeah. Mr. Palmer? I would like to add to what Aida and, and Mvemba said, that in the, the process of Senko, of the, the, the priest, is maybe the last chance we have to avoid violence and things like that. But I think the, the, the principal problem in, in political space in Congo is the lack of trust within all those, the, the parties. And this mistrust is, is we can see it with constitution. We, both parties, especially the government, doesn't respect any agreement they, they have with <coughs> opposition in the past. Uh, even in Congolese people, we have the constitution, which is such a, a huge agreement with everybody and which is not respected. So the, the lack of trust doesn't create a space in which people may, may uh, have a talk and go to, to a, an agreement that is, it is sure that it will be respected. 
and the President Kabila has the key to uh, to bring the solution to that. He, it, it's, it's very simple for him to say he will not run for a third term, to say it very clearly and not just saying he will respect the constitution while we, we know while we know the interpretation of the constitution for them is very different for the what the constitution say. So President Kabila, if he says clearly he will not run for the first term, if he uh, engages himself to respect fully the constitution and if he create a space for dialogue in um, freeing all those opposition leaders who are in jail and civil society activists, it may be the first step to really give the, the um, show to people that he really wants to bring a space for, 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 that, for that dialogue. And I think another thing is that and to, to come uh, to that point, I think the, the such sanctions may be important to, uh, to show, to, to add pressure to him and, his, and people around him to know that if there is killing, if things uh, turn worse in, in, in the end of December, they will be, they will, people will hold them accountable. People, they will be responsible for what we will happen. And I think maybe uh, regional leaders may, may be involved in, in this process, although we know that the, the, re the problem of Congo is the same thing that's happened in Brazzaville in, and in country surrounding us. So as a Congolese citizen, I, I, I really don't, doesn't have any uh, confidence in, in, in regional leadership because I know it is the same kind of uh, leaders. Um, I would just add that uh, I think the Senko uh, mediation effort is good. There, they have the trust of both sides. Uh, but I think the real issue right now is that Kabila uh, and the government doesn't really have a, uh, a reason to make any concessions right now. And so any deal that uh, that it would agree to would be a bad deal for the Congolese people. I think the the mentality right now, is, as the others uh, highlighted here, is that, well, we can throw some people in jail, shut down some media stations, control information, um, uh, and, and intimidate uh, democratic protesters by rolling out the tanks and the presidential guard. Uh, I think that, um, so therefore the leverage is needed to help push that uh, uh, process forward and, and, and really um, uh, allow the government to, to uh, make some concessions there. I think the congressional resolution on Congo that was passed recently was excellent. I'd really like to thank um, uh, yourself and, and representatives uh, Roy Smith, Bass, and Engel for pushing that forward. I think um, uh, now we need something to help, uh, uh, you know, engage the administration directly um, and say, look, we need some steps taken now because otherwise, you know, there will be no good deal at all. Um, and and you know, if if the if the government doesn't make any other concessions, that we need to we will escalate those steps. So uh, perhaps a a a meeting of a few members. Uh, with uh, some senior officials. Uh, we understand that uh, uh, Ambassador Rice and the National Security Council is um, increasingly uh, uh, you know, heading the administration's policy on Congo. So uh, I would urge uh, either a meeting or a call or perhaps a letter to her uh, to, to move the situation forward. Yeah, well, we're happy to do that. And again, I mean, in terms of some of the specifics that have been mentioned in the testimony here today, work with us to get some, so we can turn something around very quickly. And look, and I, I, I um, you know, I, I think we're all, we all believe that an agreement, just for the sake of an agreement that doesn't do anything, is not a solution. You know, I, I, we, we want, we want an outcome by the 19th that is, uh, that is reasonable and rational, and, um, and you know, and, and, and takes into consideration all sides and respects the opposition. Um, but also something that is believable, something that can be enforced and something that can be monitored and that has consequences for those who don't keep their part of the bargain. I mean, short of that, then, it, then, it, then you don't have much of anything. I, mean, I, I think the goal here is to try to avoid what I think is almost certainly will happen if there is no agreement, and that is uh, more repression, more violence, more civil unrest. And I think that is just, uh, you know, a bad uh, deal for the, for the people um, 
you know, who, uh, who have already suffered so much. You know, we've talked about, uh, you know, the crackdown on opposition. Does anyone have any idea of how many political prisoners right now are behind bars? Approximately. And I mean, the government tells us that they've released people and all this kind of stuff. But I, I understand a lot of there are a lot of people that remain behind bars, and there continues to be intimidation and threats. What are we talking about, Ms. Sawyer? Um, well, we at Human Rights Watch we have a list of 29 senior opposition leaders and other political prisoners who are still in detention. Uh, cases that we've documented where they were clearly arrested for participating in a peaceful political meeting or demonstration, or because of what they said, calling for the constitution to be respected. Uh, there have been dozens of other people arrested in the past few weeks. Some of them have re been released. Some of them are still in detention. Uh, hundreds of people were arrested during the September 19th demonstrations. We have not been able to document all of those cases to see if perhaps some of them were involved in, in violence, uh, but at least 29, but the actual number is probably higher. Mr. Boma, you, in your testimony, you mentioned a list of 35, quote, democracy predators um, who, in your view, should be subject to, uh, to citizen sanctions. What criteria do you, do you use when you put people on that list? I, I think the... the the name of those people is really known and very well documented by Human Rights Watch, by ENOUGH Project, by uh, UN um, Office of Human Rights, and by so many in NGOs. And we can see uh, in Congo, we, we know we, there is those reports, there is um, information that we receive every day of, of their action, and there is also uh, clear um, Influence from from them, uh, clear clear information, uh, clear uh, uh, power that they have around President Kabila, and that the the influence they can have to them. There is also among those people, people who are being um, uh, seats. Uh, how can I say it? People who whose name uh, appear in so many scandal like, like uh, Panama Papers, like. Uh, Lumumba papers, the, the last one in Congo, and in in other many uh, reports which show their link with uh, in in mineral resources, in business, unclear business, and and in human rights violation. That that is kind of people. Okay. Mr. Lejnev, in your t testimony, you argue for a credible interim government after December 19th. So, uh, what factors or characteristics would lend credibility to a transitional or interim government? Well, I think that uh, it's important to have meaningful uh, uh, participation by the opposition. It can't be, you know, one representative of one splinter faction. Uh, I think that there needs to be confidence build up with the Congolese people that, in fact, there will be election held by a certain date, and that's got to be in 2017, not 2018. I think also that uh, the, the, the Congolese people are waiting uh, uh, on the, the edge of their seats to hear the announcement that Kabila will not uh, participate in those elections. In fact, he will step down at the end of that transition. I mean, let's not forget that uh, there have been many different dates named. April 2018 is the latest one. If we move past December 19th with no deal, no credible deal, that could easily be pushed further and further and further. So it's really important that we get um, uh, some key benchmarks together now. And I think the strategy that uh, Special Envoy Periello is pursuing with the benchmarks is, is good. Uh, I think the problem, though, is that we don't have enough. Uh, we have a lot of bark behind them, but not much bite uh, right. to make them work. Mr. Dizalele, you, um, maybe you could help me understand um, the mind of President Kabila. Like, uh, what, what, what is this about? Is it, I mean, is it, is it power hungry? Um, I, the, 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 the access to money, the, the, I mean, the, what, what is the, what is the, what, what, what is, what, what, why won't he let go? Is it, is it just kind of the same old story that we uh, see in, with others around the world who uh, are addicted to power? Um, you know, because part of the deal here is, you know, to do everything we can to encourage him to respect the Constitution. But I'm just trying to understand, and, I, and if others have comments on this too, I, I, I just think it's uh, probably important to get on the record. Well, 
Congressman, I think only Kabila knows what is in his mind. Um, but this is what I'll just say within the, the context, I think, is really that gives us a bit of a sense. I think there was a lot of hope in Congo in 2001 when President Kabila came to power. He was young. He didn't grow up in Congo, so there's a lot of disconnect between the history of the individual and the people in the country. But people trusted him. People were willing to take a chance on him, particularly because he was young, which is kind of the irony today because there's a big conflict between his regime and the youth. People saw him as a break from the old regime, from the old people who had been bickering in Kinshasa. Uh, nobody questioned. People were not happy about the succession from father to son, but they were willing to give him a pass, including the opposition, including people like Chisekedi, hoping that this young man will take the country to the next level. It will just appear tremendous hope. We saw a little bit of that happen with the Sun City Accord, which brought various, different, various uh, warring faction and, and civil society to guide us to the elections. And then people continue to hope that we'll continue rising to the occasion. But that has not happened. And I think in part it's not happened. My testimony, I said, he had been abated and aided and abated by foreign powers as well. The international community did not challenge the system enough when they start going astray. Instead, the world made excuses. Well, the country is out of the conflict. This is better than Mobutu. Give the men some slack. That became the MO of the world community because they so much wanted him to, to emerge. That has not happened. So I think we need to face that music. He's done a lot of good things. We've heard that, a couple of them, uh, Sun City Accord, the reunification of the country. But Congo is a big country, it's the size of Eastern United States. It's not the task of one person. We are, the Congolese are tired of, pers of cult of personality. Uh, we heard that with Mobutu. We heard that with others in Africa. People are just committed to moving forward in their country. But to, to give another context, Fred is here. Fred is 26. That's how old he is. And a year and a half of that he spent in detention. So when Mobutu left in 1996, Fred was well, you were what, six. He was six years old. So now he's, he's a leader. He's an emerging leader. And we're still talking about where is the country going. So I just think um, the time to understand what is in head or somebody else's head is actually well gone. It's spent. The time is to get back to the, board, the drawing board and say this is what you had committed to do. The international community babied you and really helped you to rise to the occasion. Everything, including the Constitution, was customized to accommodate President Kabila at the time because he saw a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. And so they did that. They changed the age from 35 to 30 so he can qualify. They decide, well, the majority is going to stay. They're deciding the transition, unless, unlike what we did in Liberia, that they can run for the presidency, which was the source of the problem, because during the transition, the warring faction should have been prevented from running in 2006. This was, was successful in Liberia. That's what we didn't have in Congo. So these free passes that accumulated over time have come home to roost. So I think we need to show enough guts and gumption and to say simply enough is enough. You're spending a lot of money on DRC, you billions know. of dollars, to the UN, to election, to humanitarian process, and none of this stuff is working. Instead, the Congolese government has wasted money. They had an economic boom to the commodity boom. They're reducing the budget from eight billion, which is, was peanuts, now going on 4.5 billion, and asking civil servants to reduce the salary by 30 percent. How much more sacrifice do we ex expect of the Congolese, of the Fred Bahumas, of our youth, who've been literally sacrificed too long? And I think that's what we actually need to understand. Mm -hmm. so that's appreciate that. I'd like to add just a little bit to that. We, let's not forget that Congo is one of the most research-rich countries in the world. There's an estimated $24 trillion worth of 
copper, cobalt, tantalum, tin, gold, diamonds, oil, you name it, in the ground in, in Congo. And uh, people uh, either within Kabila's family, uh, senior officials, other business uh, uh, partners, namely um, Israeli businessman Dan Gertler and others, have personally profited from deals on these natural resources, most of which have been opaque and, and not made transparent. Uh, one of the lessons from the study that we uh, did over the last 15 months was that, you know, in fact, the history of Congo shows that uh, if you don't stay in power, um, you will lose everything. The elites don't transfer, by and large, from regime to regime. And so there's an intense fear by all those individuals and businessmen who are profiting from those deals that they will lose everything. Um, and so, uh, and, and those people would have no future in, a, in an next regime. And so I think, you know, part of the key is, number one, to enact some consequences for those individuals to say, well, you know, you, you can't just continue personally profiting from that. That's not fair to the Congolese people who should be profiting from their natural resources. And then number two, allow uh, some sort of a, um, uh, an exit strategy for some of those people to uh, to to have personal security and 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 some future in the next process. They just don't have confidence in the next process. So so those two things I think are key. Maybe should I add that. Um, even if we, we, we trusted um, Kabila for a very long time and we are disappointed every time, I think in the mindset of Congolese people, there's still that idea that if Kabila says today he will not run, people will consider him like a hero, as, as, as Perillo was saying. And maybe, maybe should I use this as an opportunity to send him a personal message for young people for, for the youth of Congo that they still have a chance for him to come in the story like a hero, like like a someone who bring hope and someone who led the country to the to, to a change. Of course they maybe he, he didn't succeed all his, his two term, all his fifteen years, but he can go and let the country uh, run by someone else. The important is the step he made and let's uh, someone else uh, le le led the country, he still have an opportunity to get in the story like a hero. I urge Kabila to take that opportunity and to let people be proud of him. Thanks. I just want to add that, that Kabila has he's become accustomed to power. He's accumulated a massive amount of resources. He's surrounded by other leaders in the region who have managed to cling on by force, change their constitutions. Uh, he probably also doesn't know what his entourage, those around him, would do if he were to step down. And I think, you know, it's, it's impossible to know exactly what, what's in his head, but I think fear of what would happen after is probably a factor. His father was assassinated. Lumumba was assassinated. Um, what will happen, you know, could he be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court? What will happen to all of his assets? I think this is probably among the, the factors that, that are, that he's, considering. So what can we do now? I think it's it's the message that, that Fred just gave, showed that there is a way out and that if he steps down honorably now, uh, his security could be guaranteed and he does have, have, have a future ahead of him. Um, and that's, yeah, trying to get that message across. Well, I want to thank you all. This, is, this has been a great uh, panel. It's, it's been very informative for me. Um, and uh, we've been making notes up here of kind of like the, the to-do list, <laughs> like now, uh, that in terms of follow-up, um, look, the, the previous panel um, comprised of Mr. Malinowski and Mr. Periello, two people I have great admiration for, and I know they care deeply about trying to get this right, and I think they deserve a lot of credit for what they have done, and, uh, and I think they would appreciate a pressure to do even more, um, you know, in these next couple of weeks, and we're happy to, to do that. Um, and I think... Um, you know, as, Fred, as you pointed out, I mean, and as the previous panel pointed out too, I mean, there's an opportunity here for everybody to come out of this winners. Um, it's a, just a short window right now, uh, but in, in, you know, if Mr. K if President Kabila is concerned about his, you know, long-term security and, you know, his place in society, um, you know, that can be ensured now. Uh, but if these negotiations don't, 
provide with the, with the bishops, for example, don't amount to anything, and you see an increase in violence, then you're going to end up with people calling for international investigations and accountability, um, and then you're down a path where there's no return, where you cannot be salvaged or cannot be rehabilitated. I mean, this is a moment right now uh, that uh, the president and his advisors either need to take, um, or they're going to go down a very different path where they'll become international pariahs, and um, and I. You know, I think for a lot of us, it's, it seems obvious what the right path is, but, you know, it's sometimes very hard to convince people in power uh, to think, uh, um, you know, um, in, a, in a rational way. Um, and we've seen that in a lot of countries all around the world. Uh, but, um, but in the short term, again, I, I, we, we want to, we, you know, we're, we're, we're in session um, for the next couple of weeks, and um, we want to be able to continue the pressure on the administration, send the right signals to the uh, uh, government um, about what we think is important. And I think there's one other thing I just want to state for the record. I have no idea what President Trump is going to be about. I really don't. I mean, I wish I knew. Um, I can't tell you what's in his mind. Um, you know, uh, I don't even want to think about it. But anyway, um, but, but I will say this, um, you know, in many respects, um, you know, that's beside the point because I do think that it is clear, based on these resolutions that we have passed in Congress, that there is strong bipartisan support, you know, uh, in favor of the of President Kabila respecting the Constitution, of respecting human rights, you know, of there to be a transitional government if that's what it, we, we need, um, you know, and to and to move beyond this impasse, uh, and that's not going to change, um, and um, and there's, and we may actually pass the Global Magnitsky Act as part of the National Defense. Authorization Act, which is coming up this week. I know that's going to be in the Rules Committee, which I'm also on uh, th this week, so it'll, it'll probably be voted on this week, and I assume it will pass the House and it will pass the Senate, and so that will be codified. Um, and so that will be another vehicle for us to, uh, to, you know, to put pressure on people. And the other thing, too, is, look, targeted sanctions at individuals, I think, is a better way to go than broad sanctions that, that hurt a lot of people. And there are, there are people that you know, uh, Mr. Lezhnev, you have mentioned, and others um, who are doing quite well um, and who are utilizing U.S. banks and resources, um, and they need to know that there's a consequence if this thing goes uh, bad. And um, so I thank you all for being here, and um, uh, I look forward to working with you in the next few days and see what we can do to uh, up the ante here. And um, and, and if not, we will come back and do another hearing next year. I hope we don't have to. I hope that we're all going to be uh, pleased at what happens in the next few weeks. But thank you very much. This